right. Welcome all um, to the forum on robotics and control engineering. Uh, again, my name is Stanislav Lusselin. I am an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of South Florida. Um, at my university, I am also directing force and laboratory for autonomy, control, information, and systems. And today, I am very proud today uh, to host Dr. Ian Peterson from Australian National University to participate in our live seminar series on control systems through the force. Um, a couple of words about the force. Um, basically, um, force is dedicated to provide free, um, high quality outreach events and online seminars to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the globe. And to support our mission, we periodically invite distinguished lecturers like, like Dr. Patterson to give talks on recent research results related to robotics and control systems. As such, we aim in connecting academicians and government industry researchers and practitioners with each other through cross-cutting research and education, education discussions. And we really hope you enjoy all series and today's series as well. All right, I am almost done, but let me mention a few words about the WebEx. So during the presentation of Dr. Patterson, we are all muted. And please ask questions after the presentation. And basically, to do so, you can uh, type your answers to the chat box, then I can read those questions, uh, your questions to Dr. Patterson. Um, please note that session is being recorded. Um, and we are going to post it to the YouTube and the uh, FORCE website. So once again, I am very proud today to have Dr. Ian Patterson. Um, Dr. Ian Patterson was born in Victoria, Australia. He received a PhD degree in electrical engineering in 1984 from the University of Rochester. From 1983 to 85, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian National University. From 85 to 2016, he was with UNSW Canberra, where he was most recently a scientific professor and an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow in the School of Engineering and Information Technology. From 2017, he has been a professor at the Australian National University. He is currently the Director of Research School of Engineering at the Australian National University. In addition, Dr. Patterson has served as an associate editor for the IEEE TAC, Systems and Control Letters, Automatica, Transactions on Control Systems Technology, SIAM, Journal on Control and Optimization, and currently he is an editor for Automatica. He is a fellow of IFAC, IEEE, and the Australian Academy of Science. And as we know, and as all of you know, his main research interests are in robust control theory, quantum control theory, and stochastic control theory. Well, for all of you who are here live today for him, I first would like to thank Dr. Patterson today in Australia, it is Saturday, and here uh, it is uh, 9 p.m., but we are very excited to have you here. And Dr. Patterson, now I am passing the presentation ball to you, and we are ready whenever we are ready. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tansel. So uh, today I'm going to talk about negative imaginary systems theory and applications. This is a, an area of uh, theory and applications that I've been interested in for uh, quite a few years now, but it's still quite active. I've currently got two PhD students uh, working in this area. And so in this talk today, I'd just like to give a, a general background to the area and talk about um, some of the applications that I've looked at, um, in particular in uh, controlling atomic force microscopes using some ideas from this theory. So um, this theory of uh, negative imaginary systems arose from a problem of vibration control in flexible structures. So these uh, control, vibration control problems in flexible structures arose in areas such as aerospace applications where people were considering large space structures or flexible dynamics of aircraft. But also more recently, they've arisen in uh, areas of advanced technology such as in nano positioning, uh, control of atomic force microscopes, control of optical sensing systems. So uh, 
there's been quite a lot of interest in this vibration control of flexible structures um, over the years and still very active. So one of the main problems in the area of uh, control of flexible structures is that the models are essentially infinite dimensional and highly resonant. So uh, a, a major problem is that of uh, unmodeled dynamics or spillover dynamics which can uh, severely degrade the control system performance and or even lead to instability in some cases if a controller is not well designed. So uh, another problem with these uh, flexible structure control problems is that there's usually large uncertainties in the frequencies of the resonant mode, the level of damping, and again these problems can lead to poor performance and instability. So as I said, one of the applications of this that I've been interested in over the years is uh, the control of atomic force microscopes. So this is a, a nano positioning application. Uh, what I've got here is a, a diagram of the operation of an atomic force microscope. And a key feature of an atomic force microscope you can see from this diagram is a cantilever, which um, enables a, a tip to move up and down across a sample surface that's being imaged. So this cantilever is a flexible structure. It's at a, um, a micrometer uh, scale, the vibrations, and it's actuated by a piezoelectric tube actuator, which leads to highly resonant dynamics that we'll see later on in the talk. So this has been uh, one of my main application areas for this uh, uh, theory that we've been developing. So the idea of negative imaginary systems theory is to develop a general systems framework for robust control of flexible structures. So uh, we're motivated by uh, these uh, problems of robust control of flexible structures and we uh, were aware of various methods which had been previously used to control these structures and felt that there was scope for a unifying theory that would incorporate all of these methods and explain their robustness properties, as well as enable us to uh, design uh, new methods of robust control of flexible structures. So that was the idea of the negative imaginary systems theory. And in particular, what, we're, what the theory enables us to do is to design controllers that increase um, the damping of uh, a flexible structure to make it uh, less uh, resonant and uh, to uh, reduce the level of vibrations. So, uh, and a key feature is that by using the, essentially the physical properties of flexible structures, um, knowing something like that if we have uh, force actuators and position sensors for our structure, then we can get certain uh, properties, which are the negative imaginary properties, and they can guarantee robustness against uncertainty in modal frequencies, as well as unmodeled spillover dynamics. So an important area of application of these uh, methods is flexible structures involves the use of piezoelectric actuators and uh, sensors. And so that, that comes into this category of force actuators and position sensors. So this is sort of a, a large-scale laboratory um, experiment that was at, uh, undertaken at the University of Newcastle a few years ago by my colleague Reza Mohamani in his lab there. And it just shows a, uh, a flexible beam which has got a number of piezoelectric actuators and sensors attached to it. And uh, the control problem is to damp the vibration in, in this beam by using these actuators and sensors. You can only see the actuators and the actuators on one side and on the other side there'd be co-located sensors, both piezoelectric patches. So this is the sort of um, experimental setup that motivated us, motivated us to look at this theory. So the first thing we might do when considering the control of a flexible structure is to uh, look at a model. And standard techniques for modeling such a flexible structure when we've got co-located force actuators and position sensors would be to use model analysis applied to the relevant 
partial differential equations, say the beam equations, in such an example. And what we'd end up with would be a transfer function matrix of this form here. So it's an infinite sum of second order terms. So each term involves a, uh, a resonant mode, which could be highly resonant, so very little damping. And then we've got that multiplied by this positive semi-definite matrix, which is the outer product of two vectors. So it's a multi-input, multi-output transfer function, infinite dimensional uh, with an infinite number of possibly highly resonant modes. So in the negative imaginary theory, what we do is we look at a matrix version of the imaginary part of this transfer function matrix, which is what we call the Hermitian imaginary part. So the idea is we take our transfer function matrix at a given frequency omega, subtract off the complex conjugate transpose of that, and then uh, multiply that by this factor of minus a half j. So this is just a matrix generalization of the idea of the imaginary part of a transfer function. And for this example, coming from uh, such a model of a flexible structure, what we find is that each one of those terms in the infinite sum is negative definite for all positive frequencies. So when we add them all up, then we get something which is negative over all positive frequencies. And that is really the motivation for this term negative imaginary. We get a model which, uh, whose uh, transfer function, um, when we take this Hermitian imaginary part, is negative over all positive frequencies. And that really follows from the physical nature of uh, these systems, and in particular when we've got these uh, co-located force actuators and position sensors, and, and thus we refer to such uh, transfer function matrices as having the negative imaginary property. So it turns out that uh, you can show by uh, some physical arguments that in fact any flexible structure with co-located co force actuators and position sensors will have a negative imaginary uh, transfer function matrix as long as we've got ideal actuation and sensing. So it's not taking into account the dynamics of the actuators and sensors themselves, which may disturb the negative imaginary property. OK, so uh, we formalize this in a mathematical definition, which is uh, the following, that a transfer function matrix has this negative imaginary property, which we'll abbreviate NI throughout the most of the rest of the talk. It's got the following properties. First of all, it's got to have um, no poles which are unstable and or at the origin. So uh, that means no poles in the uh, open right half plane or at the origin. We could, however, allow for poles on the imaginary axis which were not at the origin. So that's the first condition. Second condition is that uh, this uh, uh, Hermitian imaginary frequency response uh, property needs to hold. So we can write that succinctly in this formula here. This quantity here needs to be uh, positive semi-definite for all positive frequencies. Except, of course, when we've got a, a pole on the imaginary axis when such a quantity is not defined at those frequencies where we do have a pole on the axis, on the imaginary axis, we've got an additional condition that a corresponding residue matrix, this K0, defined in this way, um, is a positive semi-definite Hermitian matrix. So they're the three conditions that define a negative imaginary transfer function matrix. There have been some generalizations of this idea uh, to the case when we uh, do allow for poles at the origin, but uh, for brevity, we'll just concentrate on this simpler case when we rule out poles at the origin. Okay, so what's the implication of this definition? Well, it turns out, at least in the single input, single output case, um, the interpretation is quite simple, uh, in purely in terms of the phase. And the, the condition is simply that uh, the uh, phase uh, 
has to be in the closed interval between minus 180 and 0 degrees at all frequencies. Oh, you see, we can have a phase lag between 0 and minus 180 degrees at all positive frequencies. And as I said before, there's also a condition that the uh, poles have to be no poles in the open right half plane or at the origin. So another way of interpreting this is in terms of the Nyquist plot. And this, again, comes from just the negative imaginary nature of these systems, that uh, the Nyquist, the portion of the Nyquist plot corresponding to positive frequencies has to lie below the real axis, i.e. the imaginary part is negative. OK, so here's what the Nyquist plot would look like for a negative single input, single output negative imaginary system um, where we only consider positive frequencies. So we might start off at a DC value here. And then as frequency increases, we remain in this negative part of the Nyquist plot. And uh, in this example, we it would be strictly proper and eventually goes to zero. So but for all finite um, frequencies, we're down here in the negative part of the Nyquist plane. So in order to uh, obtain our main stability, robust stability result for these negative imaginary systems, we also needed to introduce an idea of strictly negative imaginary systems. And in this idea, um, we say a, a uh, transfer function matrix, which could be multi-input, multi-output, it's got to be square because it's got the same number of uh, actuators and sensors which are co-located. Uh, it's strictly negative imaginary or SNI if the following two conditions are satisfied. First of all, in this case, it's got to be strictly stable. So all the poles have to be in the open left half plane. We don't allow for any poles at all on the imaginary axis or the strict negative imaginary property. And then the second condition is a strict version of the negative imaginary property. So for all strictly positive frequencies, this inequality here has to hold in a strict sense. So in the uh, multi-input, multi-output case, this is a matrix, so it has to be a positive definite matrix for all frequencies. OK, so one of our first results that we obtained in this area and a critical one which is used in proving our main stability result is what we call a negative imaginary lemma. So a lot of the theory of negative imaginary systems is uh, analogous or similar to corresponding theory for positive real systems. And uh, this negative imaginary theory, uh, lemma is one example of that. So uh, one of the um, main results or critical Crucial results in passivity theory and positive real systems is the positive real lemma. And so a corresponding result that applies for negative imaginary systems we call the negative imaginary lemma. So this lemma relates the uh, negative imaginary property to uh, a state space realization of a given uh, transfer function matrix. So if we've got a state space realization, which is minimal, so controllable, observable, described in this form in terms of matrices A, B, C, and D, which is square, so the dimensions of the input and the output are the same, then uh, the corresponding transfer function matrix of this system would be Ni if and only if the following properties hold. First of all, uh, the matrix A has to have uh, no eigenvalues in the right half of the open right half of the complex plane or at the origin. The matrix D has to be symmetric, and the frequency domain condition is replaced by uh, the following algebraic conditions. There exists a positive definite matrix Y satisfying this linear matrix inequality and also this uh, matrix equality. So uh, those conditions altogether are necessary and sufficient conditions for this system to be negative imaginary. So 
to illustrate these ideas, and in particular this negative imaginary lemma, let's now look at an example. So suppose we've got a uh, transfer function m of s, which is this transfer function here. It looks quite complicated. Um, so in the first instance, we'll try and determine if this transfer function is negative imaginary by simply uh, doing a Nyquist plot of this transfer function corresponding to positive frequencies. Now, that's uh, the next slide. This is the Nyquist plot. We only consider positive frequencies, and we see that at all positive frequencies, the Nyquist plot lows lies below the imaginary axis. So the imaginary part is negative. The Nyquist plot is below the real axis, so the uh, imaginary part is negative. So this is, um, at least numerically, in, uh, indicated to be a negative imaginary transfer function. So one, another interesting thing we see from this plot is that there's actually a, a finite frequency in which the imaginary part is zero, and that means this transfer function is not a strictly negative imaginary transfer function. So that's this frequency here, which turned out to be one radian per second. That point, the plot actually comes back and just touches the real axis. So um, the imaginary part is zero, so we don't satisfy the strict negative imaginary property, even though we satisfy the negative imaginary property. So from this, you can see this is uh, a fairly pathological example uh, to find a system which is negative imaginary, but not strictly negative imaginary. OK, so we could verify the negative imaginary property of this system by uh, applying our negative imaginary lemma. So the first thing we would do would be to construct a mineral, minimal realization of our transfer function. So that would be the matrices A, B, C, and D. Uh, we would then um, set up the corresponding, a corresponding LMI condition, which uh, is equivalent to those conditions in the negative imaginary lemma. So if we just go back to the, the conditions here in this negative imaginary lemma, um, this is stated as one LMI and one equality, but we could rewrite these conditions to just have a, an LMI condition in this way here. So those two uh, conditions are equivalent, uh, and then this uh, LMI here could be solved using standard LMI software. And for this example, that's in fact what we can do. And we find that we do get indeed a positive definite solution to this LMI. And so by using the negative imaginary lemma as well, we can verify that that transfer function was negative imaginary. So our main stability result in the theory of negative imaginary systems considers a positive feedback interconnection of a negative imaginary system and a strictly negative imaginary system. And the idea is that this may represent um, a uh, plant, which is negative imaginary system, and a controller, which is chosen to be a strictly negative imaginary system. And uh, our stability result would then guarantee the corresponding closed loop system was stable uh, if and only if a certain um, loop gain transfer function, uh, if the loop gain transfer function at DC or zero frequency is strictly less than one. So the condition for stability in this particular case is shown to be simply this DC gain condition on the loop gain transfer function has to be strictly less than one. So uh, this is, in a sense, our main uh, robust stability result from negative imaginary systems theory. And it provides a systematic justification for why a lot of early methods which are applied to problems such as uh, control of large scale uh, space structures uh, actually work. So one such method was the so-called positive position feedback control scheme, which we'll talk about later. Uh, that was known to have good robustness properties, which were established using, uh, in some sense, more ad hoc graphical type techniques. But uh, our uh, 
theoretical results on negative imaginary system theory stability shows exactly why that those robustness property hold for that class of controller. Okay, so let's consider such a positive feedback interconnection. We've got uh, two systems, M of S, which would be uh, assumed to be negative imaginary. This might be the plant. N of S, which is going to be assumed to be strictly negative imaginary. This might be the controller. We've got a positive feedback interconnection between these two systems. And then we're considering when this positive feedback interconnection is uh, asymptotically stable. So the first thing I'll do is look at our result and just give a simple Nyquist interpretation of the result in the single input out, single output case. So all of our theory uh, actually applies for the multivariable case, uh, multi-input, multi-output systems, but uh, it's often easier to easiest to understand what's going on in this single input, single output case. So this Nyquist argument is actually quite similar to what people had previously considered in things like the control of large base structures. So the idea is that if we've got this positive feedback interconnection, such as we had here, and then one system is NI, one system is SNI, we want to use the Nyquist criterion to determine closed loop stability. And because we're using positive feedback in, uh, in this problem, then the way we would use the Nyquist criterion is we'd look at encirclements of the Nyquist point, and that point would be S equals 1 plus 0 times J. So uh, if we had negative feedback, this would be minus 1. If it's positive feedback, so we use plus 1. Then we know that our NI system has a phase lag in the, op in the closed interval between minus between 180 degrees and 0. The SNI system has a phase lag in the interval between 180 degrees and zero. This is the open interval. So if we multiply those two transfer functions to get the loop gain transfer function, then the overall phase lag has to be in this open interval between zero and minus 360 degrees for positive frequencies. So what that means is that Nyquist plot can't get any more than 360 degrees phase lag. That's the Nyquist plot of the loop gain transfer function. And it can't actually reach that, because this is an open interval. And that means that the Nyquist plot actually excludes the positive real axis for positive frequencies. So we can represent that diagrammatically. What we've got here is this uh, green shaded region is the region uh, excluding the uh, positive real axis, and in particular, the Nyquist point 1 plus J0. So that corresponds to a phase lag in the open interval between um, 0 degrees phase lag and minus 360 degrees phase lag. But we don't get quite to 360 degrees or quite to 0. Now, I've got a typical uh, Nyquist plot here. So at zero frequency, it can uh, touch the real axis. And typically, that's what would happen. So, uh, so we'd have some DC value of the loop gain transfer function. And then uh, higher frequencies, we get some phase lag, which is in this open interval uh, between zero and minus 360 degrees phase lag, but it never actually gets to 360 degrees phase lag until, in this case, at infinite frequency, it might go to zero. So from this, we can see that we're never actually going to encircle this critical point minus, uh, plus 1 plus j0, provided we start off the DC value is uh, to the left of that. So. We go around here, we never encircle that. But if our DC value was out here, and we go around here, and we would encircle that when we take the negative frequencies as well. So from this, we can see diagrammatically why this DC gain condition is critical. We just have to be left to the left of this uh, critical value 1 plus J0. 
In fact, it doesn't matter how far to the left we are. We could be over here or way down here. As long as we're to the left, we won't encircle that critical point. Okay, so now let's state this main stability result from negative imaginary systems theory. As I said, this applies in the multi-input, multi-output case. Um, but uh, it's essentially what I've just been saying before. We've got uh, two transfer functions, an NI transfer function, M of S, and SI tra SNI transfer function, N of S. And we've got some assumptions. This assumption here is essentially that a loop gain transfer function at infinite frequency goes to zero. And the second transfer, uh, the second uh, assumption is that for the SNI transfer function at infinite frequency, the value is positive. So uh, assuming those two assumptions, then the result is that the positive feedback interconnection of these two systems is internally stable if and only if this multivariable version of the DC gain condition is satisfied. So it turns out that um, from the properties of negative imaginary systems, these two DC gain transfer functions matrices have to be symmetric matrices. And that will mean that this product here uh, will have to be, uh, uh, this product will in fact always have real eigenvalues. So uh, the, DC gain, the DC gain property uh, will mean we get uh, only real eigenvalues for this matrix. And then the condition is that the maximum of those real eigenvalues has to be less than one. So for example, if all these eigenvalues were negative, that would certainly be less than one. And they could be as negative as you like. So in the size of case, you could have a DC gain of like minus 100, that would be fine. But if it's going to be plus anything, it has to be less than one. OK, so the proof of this result uh, relies on our negative imaginary lemma. Essentially, what we do is we apply the negative imaginary lemma to both the uh, uh, the NI system, M of S, and also there's a, a stronger version of the NI lemma, the SNI lemma, which we apply to the SNI system, N of S. And from uh, those applications, we get two matrices which we can use to construct a Lyapunov function for the closed loop system. As I've so also said previously, the uh, SISO case, we can interpret this purely from Nyquist arguments. OK, so see how this works. Let's uh, look at another example. So uh, this is actually the same transfer function we looked at before. So we know that one was NI, but not SNI. And this one here, it turns out that one is SNI. So. Uh, for both of these transfer functions, we've got no poles in the right half of the complex plane. And we form the loop gain transfer function, multiply these two get together, and then have a look at the Nyquist plot of that loop gain transfer function. So this is what we get, our Nyquist plot for positive frequencies. So uh, in this case, we can see the uh, phase lag of our loop gain transfer function is indeed um, between 0 and minus 360. In fact, in this case, it never even gets around to that first quadrant. So it's just in these three quadrants here. So uh, <coughs> also, the DC gain of this example is here, which is uh, certainly less than 1. And so we can't get any encirclements of the critical point. So this would lead to a stable closed loop system. OK, what I'd like to move on to now is uh, some uh, examples of uh, negative imaginary feedback controllers. So these are like standard forms of controllers that we might use to stabilize a negative imaginary system. So these, most of these controllers are actually strictly negative imaginary controllers. Uh, but we could also uh, use them to stabilize a 
strictly negative imaginary plant, that's just a negative imaginary controller, or a negative imaginary plant and a strictly negative imaginary controller. So the idea would be that you've got a particular form of a controller, such as the positive position controller, which is a, uh, in the SISO case, a transfer function of this form here. It's got dependent on a number of parameters. It's the sum of a finite number of resonant modes, each with some parameters, which are all assumed to be positive. And then um, if you look at each of these terms, we can just apply a simple Nyquist plot to any transfer function like this and find out that each one of those terms is SNI. And then we add them all up. That will also be SNI. We can also extend this idea to a multivariable transfer function matrix. So in this case, we'd have a transfer function matrix of this form, where D and omega are positive definite symmetric matrices, and K is just uh, some matrix. Then it turns out in this case, um, provided uh, K is non-singular, that that would be SNI as well. So the idea in, of these controller structures is that we're going to choose a controller of a particular form and then maybe optimize over the parameters to get good control system performance, but stability would be guaranteed by our stability result. And so as long as the plant has the NI property, it doesn't really matter uh, what its parameters are or what the controller parameters are, we're still guaranteed to get stability. We might get a degradation in performance if our, the plant is a lot different to we, what we thought it was, but we'll still not go unstable. Another interesting class of controllers, which we'll later look at in um, our AFM example, are what's called resonant controllers. So these look very similar to the previous ones, a, a sum of a finite number of resonant terms. Uh, the difference is here that we've got an S squared in the numerator. So essentially it's the same as before, as if we'd replaced a position sensor with an acceleration sensor. So that would give us this S squared in the numerator. And so what that would mean is to plug in S equals J omega, uh, we'd get minus omega squared here, combined with this minus sign here would just give us plus omega squared so that's a positive quantity. So overall, it doesn't change the imaginary part of uh, the transfer function, so it would remain as negative imaginary. Another version of the, this negative of this resonant controller uh, is something like this. So uh, it's, again, it's the sum of a finite number of resonant terms, but a slightly different numerator. And the numerator has this particular form related to the denominator. And the reason why we choose this can be seen as follows. If we look at one of these individual terms here, then we could rewrite that in this form here. So it's just this constant gain, Ki, plus this term here, which is essentially a positive position feedback controller term. So we already know that is strictly negative imaginary. And then because this is real, its imaginary part is zero. So the overall thing would be strictly negative imaginary. So this is another class of controllers which are guaranteed to be strictly negative imaginary, provided we choose our parameters to be positive. So these uh, uh, resonant controllers can also be extended to the multi-input, multi-output case. We can essentially just multiply each term by this positive semi-definite matrix written as an outer product here. Uh, that's for the first case, and similarly here, uh, in the second case, we get a matrix version of this. So. Another, another uh, quite simple form of controller, which is uh, a multi-input, multi-output uh, controller, which is strictly negative imaginary, is something which is called integral resonant control. So it's simply a controller that takes this form, in the, in the SISO case, it's actually just a first order lag. But in the MIMO case, uh, gamma and phi are positive definite matrices. 
and so this is a matrix transfer function and it turns out that we can prove using say the negative imaginary lemma that such a thing would be in fact strictly negative imaginary so uh, this type of controller has also actually been around for quite all of these controllers have been known for quite a long time they all predate the negative imaginary systems theory they were just different types of controllers people applied and it turns out they all have this strictly negative imaginary property this one uh, arose in a particular class of controllers called integral resonant control okay so let's illustrate uh, how you, you might use uh, a controller from one of these classes of controllers so the one we'll look at is this integral resonant control but we'll only look at a SISO example so that things become particularly simple in this case so our, uh, we'll assume our plant is a, uh, some sort of flexible structure with a bunch of resonant modes let's suppose we've got 10 modes um, with varying frequencies uh, quite resonant and then we're going to control it with our integral resonant controller in the SISO case this is just a simple phase lag where these constants gamma and phi are positive, just positive constants so because our plant is strictly negative imaginary our controller is actually strictly negative imaginary we'll know we get stability provided the DC gain condition is satisfied the DC gain of the plant it can be simply calculated to have this value and the DC gain of the controller only depends on this constant phi and if we for example if we choose phi to have this value then we'll get that our required DC gain condition is satisfied so that still leaves us with a free parameter gamma in the controller so we by doing this we've satisfied all the conditions of stability but we'd like to use this extra freedom in this parameter to get a better performance in our controller so the way we can do that is look at some sort of root locus of the closed loop poles as we vary this additional parameter gamma and that's what we've done here so this is a root locus diagram of the poles of the closed loop system there were 10 modes so uh, they're all uh, or some of them are labeled here so in particular in designing this parameter we're going to concentrate on this first um, mode here so that's the poles the corresponding zero and as we vary that parameter we can see that we can actually get quite a lot of damping we can actually damp it right down and bring it right over here in the left half plane so that's what we'll do we'll uh, choose the value of gamma corresponding to that maximum damping of that mode that probably won't uh, give us the maximum damping of our other modes but at least we know we're guaranteed stability so what we did then we chose that particular parameter value that led to our integral resonant controller which is this simple controller here then we formed the closed loop system and looked at the Bode plot of the closed loop system and compared that with the open loop Bode plot to see how much damping we'd achieved by putting in this controller this is the result that we got so uh, the blue line here is without the controller so that's the open loop case so it's quite resonant and we've got all these resonances we can see and then we uh, put in the controller that's the red dotted line we can see we've damped this first resonance quite a lot it's gone all the way down to here uh, the second resonance has also got quite a bit of damping maybe not as much etc so but even though we concentrated on the first mode in our design the other modes which we didn't really take into account with our design also get some good damping and certainly the system remains stable okay so that's all I'd like to talk about the theory of negative imaginary systems what I want to move on to now is uh, some physical interpretations so uh, 
so far we've just said we've got this um, these systems, say a NI system and an SNI system. We connect them in positive feedback. We know uh, that the closed loop system will be stable provided a DC gain condition is satisfied. And but we maybe don't really have any reason why that should be true. We, we know that we can prove stability using some sort of Lyapunov type arguments based on using the negative imaginary lemma. But what I want to do now is think about this stability condition in terms of spring mass damper systems. So the idea is that we can think of um, the stability result as involving a plant which is a spring mass damper system where we've got a co-located force actuator and position sensor and that's coupled to a controller which is uh, as another spring mass damping system. So, so in fact, the, the way that the controller is coupled to the plant is actually via a spring. So because in a spring, the uh, force is proportional to the displacement, that's like having a force actuator and a position sensor. So, uh, so this sort of mechanical interpretation of uh, of this feedback interconnection kind of gives some justification for why this might be true. So let's first of all consider a very simple case when our controller is just a constant gain, which is negative. And the plant, as I've said, is a spring mass system where the input is the force applied to the mass and the output is the corresponding displacement. So we can think of that setup as something like this. So we've got a spring mass damp assisting. This is the system. This is the mass that we're thinking about. The output is the position of that mass. The input is the force applied to that mass via a spring. So then our controller, actually it should be minus, our controller is then uh, just something which is gives a force proportional position, which is, of course, a spring. So it's just like taking our spring mass damper system and adding this other spring onto it, which, of course, would not make it go unstable. So there's a corresponding interpretation of this like this for positive real or passive systems where we've got, instead of position measurement, we've got velocity measurement, and then we've got a situation where force is proportional to velocity, and the control is like adding just a damper to the system, something uh, which in which force is proportional to velocity. So, of course, that improves the damping of our system. But in this negative imaginary case, what we're doing is rather than adding a damper, we're adding a spring to our system. So it uh, certainly doesn't make the system go unstable. And that's, I think, one of the key ideas. So let's see how that plays out if we actually do some modeling of this. So suppose we've got our plant, which is this spring mass damper system. We can model in in this way, where we've got a certain system. It might have many modes and uh, many springs and masses in there. So x could be quite high dimensional. And the system transfer function is defined by these matrices M, D, and K, which are all positive definite. And then uh, we get these differential equations describing the system and this corresponding transfer function. So straightforward to verify that um, this transfer function would be uh, SNI. And if we go back to our controller transfer fun function, it's just a constant gain. So if we take the imaginary part of that, that's just zero. So that would be a negative imaginary controller. It's not strictly negative imaginary because it's the imaginary part is just zero, not strictly less than zero, but it's still negative imaginary. So then according to the theory, we would get closed loop stability provided the DC gain condition is satisfied. So if we looked at the DC gain, we've got this uh, product between the plant and the controller at DC, then from the plant, we can calculate the DC gain as just this term here. For the controller, we get just minus K. So overall, we get um, this quantity here, 
which is going to be negative provided k is positive, i.e. we've got a real positive spring. So of course this condition will be satisfied because this is a negative number which is going to be less than 1. It's less than 0, so it's less than 1. So it's automatically satisfied in that case. And this actually also opens up an interesting possibility that we could even have allowed k to be negative, i.e. we could have a spring which is some sort of active spring which gives a force which goes in the opposite direction to the displacement. So in this case we could still guarantee stability provided the spring constant wasn't too large compared with this DC gain quantity uh, corresponding to the plant. Okay, so that's I guess the most simple uh, case of this idea that mechanically we can think of our negative imaginary systems theory uh, stability result as uh, arising from the fact that if you've got a spring mass damper system and then you connect a, a controller consisting simply of a spring that, uh, that things will remain stable. So let's generalize this to the case where we've got a dynamic controller rather than a static controller. And here we'll look at a more specific example. So a plant is just this simple uh, single mode uh, spring mass damper system. We've got a spring, we've got a mass, and we've got a damper. So because we've got a damper there, that would be strictly negative imaginary. That's our plant. Then we've also got a controller, which consists of another spring mass damper system, very similar, but and also the controller consists of this coupling by the spring. So we can think of the plant output as the position of this mass M1 and the plant input is the force applied to this mass M1. So that's force actuation and uh, position sensing. So to analyze this situation we could just write down the standard equations of motion for such a, an overall spring mass system. We get something like this and then by looking at um, the plant, considering the input to the plant is the force, F, the output of the plant is the displacement, X1, we can uh, take the past transforms of these equations and come up with uh, the transfer function from here to here is this simple transfer function here. And this, provided these constants here are positive, this is a, a simple example of a uh, strictly negative imaginary transfer function. Okay, so next we move on to the controller. So we're thinking about positive feedback interconnection. And so for the cro controller's point of view, um, the input to the controller is the output of the plant, which is the variable x1. And the output of the controller is the input of the plant, which is the force uh, f, which we can write in this way. It's the force produced by the spring. So uh, taking the plus transforms again from our equations, we can then find the controller transfer function N of S uh, to be described by this formula here. And again, uh, provided all of these constants are positive, uh, then it's straightforward to verify that this thing would be uh, negative imaginary. So then we can uh, inter again interpret our net NI stability result as just saying this feedback interconnection will be will be stable provided the DC gain condition is satisfied. Okay, so in fact we can relax things a bit because if we've got a strictly negative imaginary plant we can allow for the controller which is only negative imaginary. So go back to our diagram this damping here is positive, so we've got a strictly negative imaginary plant. We could allow the controller to be just negative imaginary, so we could get rid of that damping in the controller if we wanted. So that would be uh, D2 equals zero. And indeed, we could also allow K1 or K2 to be negative, provided this sum is still positive. And then the other thing, of course, we need is the DC gain condition.
So in this case, we can calculate the DC gain condition to be this. So if everything's positive, then this overall will be a negative number, which of course is less than zero, which will be less than one. So it's automatically satisfied. But um, we, if we allow for some negative springs, such as one of these K or K2 to be negative in the controller, then uh, this condition will be satisfied provided this restriction holds. So it turns out this, if this restriction holds, then K1 plus K2 being positive has to hold as well. Okay, so, so they're just a couple of examples which give us some sort of mechanical interpretations of our stability result. These are all single input, single output examples, but it'll be fairly straightforward to extend to multi-input, multi-output examples. We could operate in multi-dimensions, say two or three dimensions rather than just one dimension, or have multiple couplings <coughs> between the plant and the controller using multiple springs. Okay, so what I want to finish off with is um, some application of um, the negative imaginary theory to uh, uh, control of atomic force microscopes. Uh, this is some work that I did at uh, UNSW Canberra uh, with two of my colleagues, Sajil Das, who was a student at the time, and Himanshu Pota. So what we're proposing to do here is to look at a multivariable controller using resonant control, which we know is one kind of NI controller, to control our atomic force microscope in order to try and achieve high-speed tracking, um, which is needed to get high-speed imaging in an atomic force microscope. And so in an atomic force microscope, as I explained before, um, the way it works is that we have this piezoelectric actuator, which is called a tube scanner, which enables the AFM to scan a sample using a raster scan pattern. So it's this sort of back and forth pattern to scan across the whole image. And the faster we can do that, the faster we can get our image. So this is a, uh, just a picture of the atomic force microscope that we had. This is a commercial atomic force microscope, um, but we had um, some facility for replacing the commercial controllers, which were just PI controllers with our own controllers, which we use these resonant controllers. So uh, these instruments have lots of applications, and some of them nanofabrication, DNA uh, imaging, nanotechnology, nanolithography. Okay, so to explain the part of the atomic force microscope that we're interested in, this is a, another very rough block diagram about how the atomic force microscope works. So we've got this piezo tube scanner, which enables, which acts as an actuator in the X, Y, and Z directions. And there's actually feedback controllers operating in each of those axes. So we're actually only interested in the X and Y directions, which are to do with the scanning process. So uh, this is moving this tip, uh, which is attached to the cantilever, moving that across the sample to scan out the whole sample. Now the sensors used here are not piezo sensors, but actually capacitive sensors. So uh, in the, at least in the X and Y direction, in the Z direction, there's a laser sensor, which is used to uh, determine the deflection of the cantilever. But we're not concerned with that Z direction. We just leave the standard controller that was, came with the instrument in the Z direction. And we want to change the X axis controller and also the Y axis controller. This is just a photo of the piezo tube scanner. Uh, it's got a number of electrodes which enable us to actuate in the X, Y, and Z direction. It turns out that there's pretty good decoupling between these different directions, but it's not perfect. And one of the things that we wanted to do in our controller was to try and uh, decouple at least the X and the Y directions, which is what we were concentrating on. So characteristics of these scanners is that they tend to be highly resonant. So they're the sort of things that, um, that we want to 
want to deal with with uh, our negative imaginary theory is how to damp these highly resonant oscillations. In particular, uh, in this scanning operation, we're applying a raster scan signal in the X direction. So we're scanning that uh, at, in a quite fast way. And the signal, the reference signal that we want to track in the X direction is a triangular signal. So this triangular signal contains harmonics, in fact, the odd harmonics, up to quite high frequencies. And these harmonics can actually excite the mechanical resonance of the scanner. And that leads to poor performance because we get these vibrations, which then come out to be essentially distortions in the image. So if we just looked at the uh, characteristics of our um, piezo scanning tube, say in the X direction, uh, we'd have some sort of a res highly resonant mode. And for commercial AFMs, the way they avoid this problem usually is just to operate it very slowly. So the scanning speed might be, say, 1% of this resonant frequency. So that means if you go very slowly, you can get very good um, responses because you don't excite this resonant mode. But if you want to go quickly and get an image quickly, for example, for a biological sample, which might be changing reasonably rapidly. If you don't sample, if you don't scan quickly, it might have changed before you complete the image. Then you want to try and make your atomic force microscope scan much more quickly. And that was the practical problem we were looking at. So, if we don't do anything to try and control these vibrations, this is typically what might happen. We'll get uh, if we look at the actual motion of the AFM. It's meant to be this triangle wave, which is doing the scanning, but what we end up is a triangle wave with these oscillations imposed on it, which can lead to a distorted image. So our control is going to operate in the X and Y directions. We're doing the scanning in the X and Y directions. So it's a multivariable problem, a two by two problem, and we want to, first of all, identify the transfer functions of the system that we're going to control um, so that we can see whether the theory might be applicable and also to try and optimize the controller to give at least good nominal performance. So the way we did this was experimentally we used a swept sign signal analyzer to get frequency response data and then we constructed a state space model using a standard subspace system identification technique. So this diagram here gives us the four transfer functions that we looked at. These are the Bode plots, magnitude and phase for the four transfer functions, which make up our two by two transfer function matrix. And the, um, the two diagonal ones are what we're using mainly for the tracking in the X and Y direction. So we can see we've got these resonances here that we want to damp those resonances to try and reduce the effect of the vibrations that we get from high-speed tracking. But also, um, if we look at the off-diagonal terms, the magnitudes are much smaller, but they're still there. We've got uh, quite a bit of uh, coupling uh, still left over between the X and Y direction. So we'd like to reduce that as well. Now, the other thing, if we look at the phase, um, the first thing we notice is that um, there's actually a sign change here. So we can easily deal with that. So it starts from plus 180 degrees rather than zero. So if we just change the sign, it would go back to zero. And then if we look at the phase lag, we go down to about that frequency there and we get 180 degrees phase lag. But beyond that, we actually get even more phase lag. So we go beyond the allow what's allowable for a negative imaginary system. So we might think that this um, sort of violates the physical reasons, reasoning about when you should get a, a negative imaginary system. And there's a couple of explanations for this. One is that the actuator and sensor that we're using here is not perfectly co-located. So we're using these piezo uh, tube actuators with these uh, electrodes. If we go back the picture. We've got various electrodes here, so that's effectively where the actuation is happening. But then we're using a capacitive sensor, which is maybe we might put a sensor over here. So it's not perfectly co-located with these 
actuate with these patches which are, represent the actuator. So that's one reason why it's doing that. The other reason is that the electronics involved in the capacitive sensor introduces some delays and that means some, ex means some extra phase lags at high frequencies. So uh, these extra phase lags here can come from the non-colocation and from those extra phase lags from the sensor electronics. But fortunately, um, we're really not concerned so much with what happens at these very high frequencies. It's mainly this frequency range around here. And so uh, from this frequency range, we can still use our negative imaginary theory. But to guarantee stability over all frequencies, what we need to do then is to make sure our gain is much lower of our, our loop gain is sufficiently low at high frequencies. So rather than using the negative imaginary lemma, effectively we're using the small gain theorem to guarantee stability beyond this negative imaginary range. This is the type of controller structure we proposed. It's a multi-variable controller. So these signal lines are uh, two-dimensional vectors representing the x and y directions. And where we're using an, our negative imaginary resonant controller is this feedback loop here. So this is the plant. We've got an inner feedback loop, which is aimed at damping the resonances. So as part of the overall control system, though, we're also interested in tracking this triangular wave reference input. So what we do is put in an outer loop and some integral action here. That's going to be an integrator here so that we get um, good tracking of the reference. So the inner loop is to damp the, uh, the resonant behavior of the, of, the, of the system. And then the outer loop is to give us good tracking. So uh, we're using a resonant controller and also this integral controller. So as I said previously, we've got a bunch of parameters in here. And we simply optimize over these parameters to get good performance. So in this case, the way we do that optimization, what we'd like is that we want to get uh, good performance in terms of a flat frequency response to our reference signal out to some certain bandwidth. And also, we want decoupling between the x and y axes. So the way we represent this is having an ideal transfer function, which is something like this. So perfectly decoupled between x and y axes, and then flat frequency response out to some desired bandwidth. So this is our ideal reference transfer function. And then we optimize over our controller parameters to try and get as close as possible to this for our nominal model, and then rely on the negative imaginary theory to give us robust stability. Because we know that our actual model uh, might be quite different from the nominal model due to changes in resonant frequency, etc. So we may not get optimal performance when that happens, but we know we've got guaranteed robust stability. OK, so this is what happened uh, when we uh, constructed the controller in that way. Uh, then the blue line is the original open loop uh, characteristics in the x and y directions. And then the red line is the closed loop. So say so in the x direction, we see we've got quite good damping now of that resonance. We've got a very flat response out to this roll-off frequency. Uh, similarly, for the y direction, we've damped the resonance, got a flat response. And also for the uh, decoupling the two directions, we see at least at DC, at low frequencies, we've got a significant reduction in the coupling there for that one and in the coupling there. So at least just in terms of frequency responses, it looks like uh, we should have a good controller. Next step was actually experimental validation. And the first thing to do was just look at how well we track the, uh, the raster scanning signal. So what we've done here is um, looked at our controller with different scanning rates, starting off very slow and then going up to very fast. So very slow is about 15 hertz scanning rate. Very fast is 125 hertz. So at the very slow end, uh, we've got the blue line, which is the reference signal, and the red dotted line is the actual signal. So 
as we expect, we get very good tracking at low frequencies. But when we get to very high frequencies, we're still doing pretty well, except we've got a bit of delay that we don't quite um, follow it instantaneously. But in this imaging application, it doesn't really matter if there's some delay in the tracking signal. The main, the main thing that's important is actually the shape of the uh, raster scan signal. It should be as close as possible to this perfect uh, triangle wave. So it's distortions in that shape which get lead to distortions in the image. Now let's look at what happens when we look at the actual images. And what we've done here is we compared three different cases. One was the case when we didn't apply any controller at all. We just did things open loop. We just applied our reference signal uh, in the X and Y directions without any feedback control. The second case, and that was this one, second case was when we used the built-in PI controller, which was designed for a very slow operation. And then the third case was when we used our controller. So if we look at the first case with open loop, what we find is that there's this skewing of the image. This is a, a reference sample that we're imaging, which is known to have like a, a ideal checkerboard pattern. And then we're looking at what actual image we get. So in this case, we get quite a good image, except it's been rotated a bit. And that's because of this coupling, that the coupling between the X and Y axes means that you get an image which looks like it's been rotated. Otherwise, it looks quite good. The, um, the, the built-in PI controller is uh, it's good at, at make, getting rid of that um, decoupling because it's got integral action in there. But it, um, it's starting to show a little bit of distortion, actually, even at this very low frequency, and whereas our controller is looking pretty good uh, at this low frequency. So then what we do is we start getting to uh, much higher frequencies. So uh, this is uh, a much higher frequency, 62.5 hertz. Turns out that the uh, no controller case is, um, is still, of course, slanted. It's starting to get a bit of distortion because the, res the, uh, the, the, the resonant modes of the scanner are starting to get excited. In the PI case, because it was only designed to work for low frequencies, it's just not keeping up with this very fast um, uh, signal, reference signal. So it's getting a lot of distortion. And our controller is still doing, uh, doing very well. It's got a little bit of distortion, uh, probably a bit better than the no controller case. And of course, it's um, perfectly square. Then we go to a very high frequency, twice that again, 125 hertz. Now, the, um, the no controller case is has now started to completely break down because now the uh, the resonance in the in the actuator has now been fully excited in that no controller case. The um, PI controller, just because it's slow, um, is still very much more distorted. Whereas our controller, uh, it's starting to get some distortion, but it's still looking uh, reasonable. So. Uh, we've got uh, quite a good improvement, we think, compared with uh, just the open loop case or with the slow PI controller. OK, so that's all I'd like to say about the example. And that's really the end of the talk. Uh, we've considered a class of systems we call negative imaginary systems. Uh, these, these have been very useful to cap capture some robust stability analysis results. Uh, and that result talks about this positive feedback interconnection between a negative imaginary and a strictly negative imaginary system, and then uh, giving a condition for stability in terms of this DC loop gain being less than one. So we've got a, a framework for analyst analysis of robust stability of flexible, uh, lightly damp flexible structures. And we kind of capture some of the previous methods used in this area. And then uh, it's motivating uh, continuum work, to, which is directed towards uh, finding systematic sort of optimal control methods of designing such controllers, rather than just the parameter optimization we talked about in this talk. There's also actually a lot of connection to the passivity theory, positive real theory, which we alluded to here. And uh, 
really the way we think about these results is they sort of extend and also complement the passivity results. So the passivity results are really about the case when there's force actuators and velocity measurements, whereas negative imaginary systems theory is about the case when there's force actuators and position measurements. And these uh, typically arise when we've got things like nano positioning systems, atomic force microscopes, where we're using these piezoelectric sensors and actuators. Okay, we also talked about uh, some physical interpretations of our theory uh, in terms of the spring mass systems and thinking about the uh, stability result is involving coupling to a controller where we've got this spring coupling as opposed to the positive real theory or passivity theory, which is thinking about um, coupling in terms of a damper. So uh, the idea of these physical interpretations, they might give us some better understanding of the results, but also might motivate new extensions such as nonlinear extensions, etc. Okay, and finally, we've considered a practical application of these ideas in this problem of AFM scanning. Okay, that's all of my talk, so I think it's uh, time maybe for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. It was a great talk. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. All right, so <clears throat> um, now uh, from the audience, uh, we would like to take some questions and um, basically, you can ask questions in uh, two different ways. One, uh, you can basically ask through the chat box, and then I can read your question to Dr. Peterson. Um, second option is you can unmute yourself and directly ask questions, but don't forget that we are uh, recording the session, so if you don't want your voice to be included, you can still use the chat box. And uh, Dr. Peterson, sometimes uh, our um, audience um, uh, is shy uh, and <laughs> they tend to ask more questions after the talk, but now uh, we started to get some questions. Um, okay, so the, the first question is from Ahmed Taha Koru. Um, I am reading directly to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peterson, for very clear and rich presentation. I benefit a lot from your works, as always. I have two questions. Uh, my first question, I see that SNI systems has a lot of beneficial properties, very simple stability condition if coupled with an uh, NI, just a second, um, NI feedback, especially it is very powerful tool for infinite dimensional systems in my opinion. I am curious that if an NI system and an ordinary feedback controller is used, do we lose all of the properties and turn into a standard control problem, or are some properties of NI systems we can still use? Okay, so I think the question is that um, what I talked about here is the case when we've got an NI system and we use, say, an SNI controller, but what the question was asking is, suppose we have an NI system and we use some other control, kind of controller, like a PI controller, would that, um, or PID controller, or something which is not strictly negative imaginary, would that still provide some useful properties? Um, I guess I haven't really thought about this question this much. Usually I've been thinking about ways of um, trying to convert problem feedback control problems into this situation where you've got a, an NI plant and an SI controller. And but unfortunately, that's not always possible. And I think you know, some uh, situations such as a, a PID controller wouldn't fit that into that. So you notice in the AFM example, we kind of address this problem by looking at two, an inner and outer feedback loop, where the inner feedback loop um, was addressing one part of the problem, which is the, um, which is the damping of the vibrations. Whereas once we've done that in a robust way, then we think of the outer feedback loop as um, as addressing the other part of the problem, which is the tracking when we wanted the interval action. Um, 
some of the later theory we talked about where we allow for poles at the origin could be uh, one of the motivations for that would be to think of a controller, an NI controller having poles at the origin. Um, but there was to apply that theory, it was it seemed like quite restrictive to um, <coughs> to actually have something like a PI controller because the condi the DC gain condition had to be replaced there by another condition that seemed like that condition was quite restrictive. Um, so I'm not sure if that's really a, a sort of definitive answer. I guess another thing that we did find though is that quite a few sort of standard types of controllers do fit into this framework. And so I talked about quite a few, but it turns out some other really common ones like a phase leak controller, it turns out, also fits into this framework or a double phase leak controller. So so there are a lot of controllers that do fit, fit into this framework. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. So uh, second question. Yeah. Can you show us the LMI condition of negative imaginary lemma. Yeah. There were off diagonal terms which were supposed to equal to zero. Hence, off diagonal terms can be multiplied by a positive scalar uh, kind of a Lagrange multiplier, but it won't be an LMI anymore. In your LMI, T equals to 1. Does it lead to a sort of conservatism in solutions of LMIs, or is this uh, an if and only if condition? Ah, yes. Yeah. So that we, we're going to... So the original um, uh, SN, uh, negative imaginary lemma was this one here, and this is an if and only if condition that um, assume that all of these conditions, the system is NI if and only if all of these conditions are satisfied, and in particular these two conditions here. And it was these two conditions here that we converted later on into a more standard looking LMI, which was this one here. So essentially for this LMI to be satisfied, it's if and only if that first one one block is negative and this block is zero. So uh, from this point of view, this is also a, a, an if and only if condition, that those two things are actually exactly equivalent. The only, the only difference is this fits more easily into the particular LMI software that we're using. So there wasn't really anything more than that, apart from just finding a convenient way to fit into that LMI software. Thank you so much. And um, so can we say that if our, our audience uh, have more questions, can they directly email to you? Ah, uh, yes, yes, that would be fine. Um, perfect. And um, by this, I would like to end uh, the talk. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. And especially in Australia, it is Saturday. Here it is 9 p.m. Uh, right now. 10.30 p.m., but I think it was one of the best Friday nights. So, um, Dr. Peterson, first of all, and uh, thank you so much uh, for your talk, and it was a pleasure to host you here online. Okay, well, thanks very much for everyone for listening. So, thank you. And thank all you right. for having me. And for those who are in uh, Eastern Time, have a good night. Yeah, okay, good night. Good night, bye. Bye.